Well, he's a four-time and defending Cottage Grove Speedway track champion of the Freezen Performance IMC Modified. He's also won the state title for the state of Oregon in 2021. Our next guest on the Beyond the Flags podcast is out of Springfield, Oregon, car number 5M, Jake Maiden. But before we get to the interview, make sure wherever you're listening or watching from, you hit the like button and subscribe so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Well, joining me on the Beyond the Flags podcast, he hails out of Springfield, Oregon, driving Freezing Performance IMC Modified number 5M, Jake Maiden. Jake, really looking forward to this interview. You and I, we go way back. We've got uh, a lot of good history with each other and uh, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. I think uh, you started announcing the year before I started racing, so we do have a long history. Yeah, I know. We actually got to announce with each other, I'm thinking, what, 2011? You you were kind of a, it was my phase where I had some color commentators come up. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I think that was 2011. I was up there once or twice and uh, kind of get my feet wet and uh, see the other side of it, I guess you could say. Yes, yes, no doubt. Uh, and you did a really good job, too. I was trying to think who else. Uh, Randy Martin spent some time up there. or Yeah, he had spent some time up there. I want to think maybe like as far back as maybe earlier than 2011. Now I'm really testing my memory. But, yeah, a couple of cameos of some guys up there. D-Ray, I think that's where D-Ray kind of got the bug is he came up at one time just to kind of help and hang out. So, so yeah. It's kind of cool to get that uh, racer personality up there and just kind of see it from their their side of it. Exactly. You know, I always say, like, when I'm talking with my producers at IMCA TV, um, I always compliment good color commentators, and I categorize you as that um, when they're <laughs> in the booth, like analysts and stuff, because, you know, I, I, I don't work on these things. So for – and, you know, technology is changing all the time. So when – when somebody's like, well, what's that? You know, it's this or that. It's like, holy smokes. Like, wait, what, what was it? Like, can we, can we break this down to simpler terms? But, but yeah, definitely, definitely. It's always cool. And it's it, that mentality too, of what guys are doing and stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think that's uh, good to have. And from your perspective, that's just more learning and more work you're trying to figure out. So it kind of helps you out at the same time. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Always, always learning new things and stuff. And like I said, I mean, the industry, like when, when you and I grew up going to races, um, the, the game was the game, right? You look at old videotapes and old pictures and stuff and, and you see some of the things you know, our parents were doing, um, and you know, uh, even, even generations before that, and you see where it's at now and it's just at a level, an unreal level and unreal in a good way. Absolutely. The engineering that goes into things now is, is way more than it was back in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, I think I would have thrived more in those decades, but you get the hands you were dealt. So, well, and something really cool that I was having a conversation with somebody and it may have been on this show too, is, you know, in our parents day, they'd race somewhere, something would break. They were going to, uh, uh, cause it was not uncommon for, for back in the, in the eighties to race three nights a week, um, in, in the state of Oregon. And, uh, you know, something would bat, you know, a spindle would break. So then they'd go to a wrecking yard or a spindle would break that night. Somebody would go, would be dispatched to the, um, to the wrecking yard, go find the car or something close to it and then rip it out or obviously doing it properly and then bring it to the racetrack. You found whatever would work. It didn't matter if it was Ford or Chevy mismatched or not. Those guys did it work. And uh, you got to applaud them for the, the stuff they, they made work back then. Most definitely. I mean, you hear it a little bit in sprint cars of guys that are able to, you know, when a frame's been, it's like, we can fix this. Like, we can keep using this still. Like, this is fixable and stuff like that. Whereas, unfortunately, with with certain levels of, of racing, um, it's more like, no, nope, just scrap it. You know, we'll just, we're just going to buy a new one kind of thing. Yes, unfortunately. And I feel like that's the, the way we are trending is if something's a little bit off, you just you got to go buy a new one and you can't make that old one work anymore. Well, talking to you, as you mentioned uh, at the top of the show, um, I started announcing r just a little bit before you got into, into being a driver, but you were there. Um, at, I remember seeing you in the pits and everything. Um, you're, you're 
earliest memories of being exposed to racing and being around the racing scene, I mean, where and what were those memories like? Uh, absolutely. My dad was racing, you know, um, I was a young kid. Um, heck, I think, uh, 1991 is kind of the first thing I remember my dad racing sprint cars and just running around Cottage Grove Speedway or, or Riverside Speedway back then and, mm-hmm. and Eugene Speedway. And honestly, that was the, the first thing I knew about racing was just my dad doing it. And if my dad was doing it, then I needed to be doing it. Well, I remember, and, and, you know, I remember as a kid, like for whatever reason or the other, and by all means, feel free if you disagree, I felt like I was living, living a whole different life, right? I'd go to the races, I'd be at people's shops and stuff. That was normal for me, right? So then when I'd go to school and people would say what they were doing, it's like, oh, we were playing Super Nintendo, or we went to the coast, or we went camping, it's like, well, that's, that's strange. But like, if I ever saw somebody with a racing shirt on, which I, you know, I've lived in Cottage Grove my whole life. There's a racetrack there that's been, been here for a really long time since 1956. If I saw somebody with the, with a, um, it was like being in a foreign country. It's like, Hey, Hey, you're an American. Hey, (laughs) Hey, Hey, kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but I just remember how unique that was. But as I got older, I realized that my friends went to the races, but then I, gain the sad reality that they didn't go every week. Like I did, they weren't, it wasn't, uh, you know, there were, they weren't frequent flyers like, like you or I, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else kid. And even to this day, I talk to people who haven't been there before they lived in, you know, the area for their whole life, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. And I'm just, I'm just mind blown that the fact that they've never made it down to the racetrack or, you know, a racetrack in general. And, um, but yes, I am the same way. When I see somebody with a t-shirt, I'll, I'll point it out to whoever I'm with, my wife or my kids, and hey, 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 look, look, they're into the same thing we are. And sure. uh, like you said, they are they are uh, few and far between. So when you do see them, it's like uh, somebody of your own kind. It's, it's kind of a cool experience. Some of my first memories of watching your dad race was in that era, era you were talking about, like the early 90s. And I remember Sunday night, or they weren't even Sunday night shows. They were Sunday day shows that uh, I'm trying to think if that Mike McCann was still promoting the place. or It was in that transitionary period between Mike McCann and Charlie DeBuff. DeBuff had the place from the early 90s till 2001, till the end of 2001, and McCann from the mid-80s to, you know, that early 90s era and stuff. And I remember Sunday shows, go, and one time my dad took me, into the announcing tower, which is currently the, the scale house at Cottage Grove Speedway. Steve Wollers is up there doing his thing. And I just had not really the run of the place, but I, it was just like, oh, my God, like I'm in the Sistine Chapel or Notre Dame, like all, you know, not by myself, but it's like, wow, this place is big and everything. And I remember your dad was actually, I don't think I've ever told you this story. Your dad was out, he was actually qualifying and Steve's doing his spiel of here's his sponsors. This is where he's from. Ty Maiden, you know, out of Cheshire. So, and, and then whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. No, no, he, he, it was just qualifying. So, you know, he was able to, he was able to crank two out without issue. Yeah, that is a heck of a story. And you're talking about the scale house. I didn't, I did not know that that was originally the um, announcing tower. That is uh, good history information. Well, yeah. So that was the. Now, I don't know. Uh, you know, and my dad's going to kill me because he's going to say that I should know this or I should have asked before. Um, I don't know when it was put in place. Probably like the 70s. I mean, it's oh. you know uh, somewhere in that era. And then it was just simply, uh, it, it could have been destroyed, right? But they decided to preserve it and repurpose it. Um, when they did the big remodel winter of 2001 into the 2002 season, which kind of is the modern era of Cottage Grove Speedway when the Leach family took over. Gotcha. That is good information to know. I have to put that in my history bank. I am uh, kind of a history nut myself. Not as crazy as you are, but um, <laughs> yeah. I'm... I'm I'm hoping to put myself in the history book someday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I remember you and this is, it's just kind of a full circle moment here. Now that I think about it, obviously 
you've made some history at Cottage Grove, winning four modified titles there, including the last two years in the state championship in 21 in a, in a Willamette Speedway championship. Uh, but you've been dabbling with the, uh, with, with the late models as well, won the track championship at Grove last year for, for Tim Morgan. But I remember you starting out in the late models, in full-body stock cars. Yes. Uh, they were sports since back then, and it was right around that transition from 06 to 07 when they they um, went to a full-blown late model, and we just ran what we had, and that happened to be an old sportsman car from probably the late 80s. And, uh, yeah, that was quite the experience. Um, and then if we could have just known half the stuff we know now, we probably could have solved a bunch of our issues the first night out. But you have to start somewhere, and uh, I guess I wouldn't have had it any other way. Sure, and it was a – well, I remember your dad got one too, like an old Russ Cell Swartz car, I think, uh, an old 50 car that he had. I'm trying to think if you had something similar. Didn't you guys have identical cars one time? Uh, they weren't identical looking, but, I mean, they were both Swartzes. Um, I think they were maybe one or two years different. Um, but uh, my dad's car was a heck of a lot nicer than mine, to say the least. <laughs> So what had kind of inspired you to do that to become a driver? Because it kind of, I, I know, I want to think your dad stopped racing like maybe around 01 or so. Last time I, let's see, I think he had, uh, what, like the t red 28 sprint car. It was like maybe 01 play day. And my dad's like, oh, cool, Ty Maiden's here. And your dad your dad said to my dad, I'm selling it. I'm bringing it here to try and get rid of this thing or something. Yeah, you know, the racing plans kind of took a turn probably in 2000, 2001. And that um, changed my racing path to say the least. Um, from a young kid, I was, I was set up to be a sprint car driver my whole life. That mm -hmm. was what I was going to be. I wasn't going to do anything else. And, and unfortunately uh, plans uh, changed. And um, so I didn't get into racing and, and I missed a lot of my high school years. I didn't go to the track. I look back on it now and I wonder, you know, what the heck was wrong with me? What was I doing? Um, and thankfully, my dad and I just kind of scrounged up some money in 06 there and, and started working on something. And, and that was really where I got my start. Um, but, yeah, I was supposed to be a sprint car driver. That was my dad did pretty much his whole career, and that was what I was going to do. And then all of a sudden, we got, um, you know, a, a full, full body car and now we're lost. What, what the heck is this thing? Yeah, yes, yeah. And, and you guys stayed there for, for a number of seasons. And I'm trying to think. When was the transition to, to modifieds and what was that transition like? Was that a very difficult one because you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're a fish in a pond, but you're in a whole different body of water now. Uh, yeah, there was a bit of a transition in 2011. Uh, I, I think I smacked the wall three times that year and was kind of tearing up some equipment and shocks were getting expensive and wheels and tires were getting expensive. And, uh, we needed to do something different. So in 2012, we came out with a modified and, and honestly, that was a lot of fun. That car handled really good. I picked up, um, a roller that Brayden hand had kind of ran of his dad the year before. And that car was great. Um, I got second at, uh, um, it was the wild west modified speed week and had a race one and, uh, had an issue under a red flag. But honestly, the transition was smooth. I felt like the modified suited me um, more of my driving style. And, uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much been doing it ever since. Well, and then since then, you guys have, uh, especially I remember during COVID too, but even before COVID and after COVID, like you guys have been able to explore some places and, and, and it seems like having a lot of fun just – just going to different racetracks and meeting new people and creating new relationships and, and making it a family thing. And that's something that I definitely note of, of you and your race team. It is a family atmosphere and you're there. Yes. You're there to win races. Yes. You're there to do as best as possible, but you're also trying to have a good time as well. Yeah. Family is big. Um, I've got good support from um, uh, my family and my in-laws. Everybody's there to support me. So I really appreciate that. And we have been able to venture, uh, been going to California the last couple of years. We haven't been there of recent, um, excuse me, I guess we were there at the end of October. Um, but yeah, California has been fun meeting people down there and, and just kind of getting used to how they run the show down there and how, um, all the drivers are And it's 
a lot different than Cottage Grove. You come back to Cottage Grove and it's kind of relaxing and down there it's hectic and on the hammer and we don't care if we tear up a, a body, we'll put a new one on it. And so definitely, uh, definitely a change from what I'm used to. No doubt. No doubt. And, and obviously the years that you've uh, battled for the state championships and, and winning it in 2021, um, that's, you know, with the, with, I guess where you compare it to other States in the country and California being one of them where, there's only a certain window of time where you can race in Oregon and everyone pretty much races on Saturday nights, but now you've got a place like Douglas County dirt track that offers Friday night races for modified. Sometimes um, it's a lot. It's you got it. And you got the IMCA wild West speed week. That's starting up too here shortly. And you throw that in and it's, it's just a lot of racing crammed in a small box as far as times considered. Yes. When you run for the state championship, it is a grind. We did it in 21. Honestly, just we kind of had that COVID year in 20 and 21. We hit the ground running and wanted to race as much as we can. And um, a lot of the times it was just my wife and I, if we were not running, you know, a local track within an hour or so. And, you know, we had to buckle down and get it done. And and, and you got to keep your car straight. You know, you can't be getting tore up. You know, if you get tore up one race and you mix the next one, you that might have just put you out of the championship. So mm-hmm. it was a grind. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I would love to do it again, but that is a that is a big time commitment, um, and and that's just a lot to ask of. Well, and then you have a place that rains out, and there may be a possibility Medford might be okay, or Banks might be okay, or Willamette might be all right, and it, it's it's like getting the truck let's go. We got a haul to make it there. Absolutely. And and now that you mentioned that, um, my racing definitely changed in 21. When I did do that, um, I was committed to running a race and probably a lot of people don't know this story. I was going to run a big race down South and, uh, and plans got changed and I was running for a championship at Willamette happened to fall into that one. And, uh, the way the points lined up, it made sense to go somewhere else for me. And I did. And, and, uh, I lost a big, one of my bigger sponsors because of that. And it was very unfortunate, but you know, when you have the opportunity to win that state championship three quarters of the way through the season, you know, you're committed, you're going to do whatever it took. And I did what it took. And I guess friendships have been lost because of that. So that is uh, a downfall from doing what we do. Well, and you mentioned things change, right? I mean, that's that's the that's the beauty, and sometimes uh, the unfortunate thing of life is is, is things happen. But for you, um, not only are you racing, doing a lot of doable duty between the modified and the late model, but you've also taken on you and your lovely wife have taken on a role as you're a parent of a race car driver now. That has definitely got to uh, add a wrinkle of. Uh, of uh, of making things really interesting for you now. Not only are you having to worry about two race cars, but you're also having to worry about your daughter, Tinley. Yes, that is a challenge in its own. Um, it, it's hard to get locked in on what she's doing. Obviously, I'm I'm doing my thing as well on the same same night. Um, so I'm juggling these things, trying to make it all happen and. And I'm trying not to be too hard on her. You know, as a race car driver yourself, you know the challenges she's dealing with and the obstacles she is up against. And and you know how you have overcome them in the past. So you kind of expect that same thing out of her. And and then you got to step back and remember that she's only 12 years old and she's driving a full-size car that most people don't get to do until they're 15 and 16 years old. So uh, a challenge to say the least. And uh, But my wife and I and the whole family are really enjoying it. And it, it's just, again, it goes back to it's so cool that you guys can stay together at the same racetrack. You know, it's not like some of these stories you hear about, you know, like Lance DeWeese or, you know, at the time Willie Croft where their kid was at Cycle Land or, you know, DeWeese's kid was racing in Pennsylvania growing up halfway across the country to Indiana and, and having not being there physically to, to, to help or, or to just watch. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're at a time in the racing career where I'm not going to be anywhere else. You know, I'm here. My, <laughs> that ship sailed a long time ago for me. So, uh, it's nice to be local and, to um, be able to see a race. And 
honestly, I'm not sure what the future holds. I mean, at some point, we're probably going to be in the same class. So I guess I better enjoy it now while I can see it. Are you looking to find that adrenaline rush, but you can't because you're not at the racetrack? Well, check out the IMCA TV replay subscription library to have access to thousands of hours of racing for just $24.99 a month. Relive all the moments of the Speedway Motors IMC Super Nationals fueled by Casey's at Boone Speedway, the Harris Clash at Deer Creek Speedway in Spring Valley, Minnesota, the IMCA TV Winter Nationals at Cocopa Speedway in Somerton, Arizona, Florida's Clash on the Coast, and dozens of Speedway Motors IMC weekly racing program racetracks from across the nation, as well as the IMCA TV Dirtcast podcast. Plus, 25% of that $24.99 monthly fee goes towards the Driver's Point Fund and is a great way to help out your local racers. In 2023, over $97,000 was paid out to IMC drivers directly at over 50 racetracks across the country. Please note that live broadcasts are not part of the replay subscription. That's IMCA TV. IMCA TV, where America comes to watch racing. Well, I, I know I've asked you this before, but there's a lot of people that don't know the story. The story with the 5M. Why number 5M for, for you, which which you've ran for a really long time? Uh, my grandpa, when he owned my dad's sprint car back in the early 90s, um, they had 5C on it. And it would have been really easy just to go with my dad's number 28. But I kind of wanted to, you know, have my own legacy and have my own number. Um, so we kind of sat down and talked about it and 5M was the most logical option for me. And, uh, you know, once we kind of figured that out, I think in 2008, um, it was the number we've had the whole time. And honestly, I probably would have had it in 2007 when I started racing, but we were so damn broke back then. We ran the same body and number and everything that was on the car to begin with. So ever since I, you know, had an option, that's the number we've been. Well, I know that uh, uh, your wife, for a while there, was coming up and telling me, like, hey, when you announce, he likes to be called the bandit. Now, I've never asked her, nor have I asked you, how did that come about? That wasn't a self, self-created self nickname, was it? Or just somebody say, hey, Jake, you stole that one, you bandit? Oh, man, I wish there was a cool story behind that, um, Ben. Um, you know... I don't know, fans, you know, they want to, they want something to remember you by. And I kind of racked my brain for a bit. And I said, man, I got to have something on this car that, that people can remember me by. Maybe they won't remember my name or my number, but Hey, I'm going to remember that guy sure. who had the bandit on the front of his car. So it is definitely self-proclaimed. No, no cool person you gave me this nickname. You didn't rob a I bank. Just, <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no cool story behind it. I, uh, I just wanted somebody to something for them to remember me by. So, uh, that's what we were able to come up with. Well, something that I like to ask about drivers is, uh, you know, like the, the area where they grew up or where they live, you live in Springfield, but, uh, you were built from Cheshire, Cheshire for so long. Um, for people that have never been to either of those places, what are some cool, unique things that you, that you can kind of check out and see? All right. Well, Cheshire, there's not much going on out there. That's out in the country, yeah. about 10, 15 miles from anything besides the convenience store and a post office. Um, honestly, Springfield, you know, we got the mountains uh, an hour away. We got the coast an hour away. We're here in the valley. I mean, uh, hiking trails. Um, but honestly, Ben, I'm all about race cars. So uh, I don't get to venture out much. I'm usually working on race car, hanging out with family. So I've never told you this. I actually went through Tresh Cheshire for like a week in the summer of 2020. I was uh, helping my cousin out. My cousin had like a little uh, construction business, and we were building a deck from scratch um, for a guy on the river out there. Um, the Long Tom. Yes, and it was past Triangle Lake. I'd never been there. Um, like we were maybe like, I don't know, five, eight miles from Swiss home. Like we're, we're, we're out there, no cell service, nothing. It's during the height of COVID, you know, all that crazy mumbo jumbo, but it was nice to get out there, but it was an enjoyable drive because it was cool to see the farmhouses. Um, there was a pretty popular place. I don't know if you've ever went to it where uh, you can like slip, literally slip down these, these falls and, um, there's like some little rapids and stuff. Uh, they're like water slides basically out of rock. Yes, those are the rock slides. 
can. Uh, not surprising because I'm more into racing. I have never been there. Um, and that fits right along with my story of the people who have never been to the races before. Hey, if you've been there, text Jake Maiden, tell him about it. So there you go. There you go. There you go. Exactly. And I mean, that was going to be my next question. What do you guys like to do as a family? But it's pretty apparent. It's, it's all about racing and not as, you know, as an enslavement to racing. It's something you guys enjoy because if you didn't, there's no doubt about it. You wouldn't be doing it. Absolutely. Um, my wife and I both grew up going to the races, um, And honestly, I'm a race fan more than I am a race car driver. Um, You know, we were, we had softball games today and yesterday, so we weren't um, doing any uh, racing, but we did go watch on Friday night and kind of wishing we were there at the same time, wondering why we're in the stands and not bringing the car there to to race. But um, 100% race fans, if I wasn't racing tomorrow, I'd still be down there hanging out, enjoying myself. a racer long before I'm a, or a race fan long before I'm a race car driver. No doubt. I can agree with you in that sentiment because there'll be times and this isn't, this isn't to, to, you know, make fun of you or anything. Like I'll just be working on something and I get a text and it's Jake made and Hey, I was reading something. Didn't this guy do something like way back in the eighties or something? Yes. And then it's always with a follow-up question where is he at now or what happened or, you know, all that, well, that car, you know, this guy got in that car. I I like that. It's really cool because it reminds me of me. And that's how I prep as an announcer is find a cool stat and then follow a a research, a follow-up stat stat for that because the race fan in me is going to be like, okay, well, who's got the second most wins or who's got, you know, who drove that car after that guy retired or switched rides. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm kind of a history buff myself, being that my dad, you know, raced sprint cars for the, when I was younger, um, that was all I was into. So I pay attention to California sprint cars, World of Outlaws sprint cars, Pennsylvania Posse. And now that I'm into modifieds, you know, I kind of uh, pay attention to those as well. So I'm curious about who is driving what car and uh, the, the history of the car and, you know, whatever happened to that guy. Um, I, I think it's my inner ADHD, uh, uh, coming out or whatnot. Cause, sure. uh, that I'm always, I'm always trying to learn something new. And unfortunately I'm not trying to learn about my damn setup on my race car. I'm more worried about history for some reason. Hey, it's okay. That's, that's, uh, that's where your, your crew chief, that's where, where they come in, where, you know, they're spinning the spanners. And, and that's funny. Uh, you mentioned me texting you because I'm still trying to get the all-time wins list at Cottage Grove to see uh, see where I'm falling on that thing. I I told you, PJ Risso. PJ Risso's got it. I mean, he's he must be like he has it in a on a thumb drive in a vault in Fort Knox or something right now. So we'll have to. PJ, when you hear this, please get back to me. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. You left me on red like six months ago. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Awesome. Well, th- this has just been a great conversation. It's always great to talk to you and your family and to run into you guys, whether we're in Washington, we're in somewhere in Northern California or the Central Valley or the Bay Area. Um, Jake, it's always a pleasure, and it's a, oh, it's been great to have the friendship that we've had for, for, uh, for decades, really, and I, I look forward to – it uh, continuing um, people that you want to think and individuals that you want to think, because to make all of this possible to, to be running two race cars, to have your kid racing all in the same night, it takes, it takes a small army to try and make all that possible. And I would just like to give you the platform to thank them. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, my wife, um, she's always right there for Kinley and I kind of getting in these race cars now is, a pain with your race fever and your Hans device and getting the seatbelts all lined up. Uh, my mom and dad, you know, obviously if it wasn't for them doing this, you know, uh, when I was younger, I wouldn't be into it. Um, now and my in-laws, I mean, Clint Willis is really the guy who makes my car run. If, if we didn't have him, I wouldn't be a eight time champion and have as many wins as I do. Um, honestly, we would be lost if we didn't have him adjusting the carburetor or working on the timing. So, also Barney, Barney Hamilton, longtime racer at Cottage Grove Speedway in Eugene. Uh, my uncle, Chuck Christian, my friend, Daniel Ray, Jason Cox, and all my sponsors over the years. I mean, there's a lot of them, so I 
they know who they are and I appreciate it. And hell, there's even people who I'm not friends with anymore and not real fond of, but they also helped me out along the way as well. And, and honestly, without all those people putting in their time and effort and kind of believing in me to a certain extent, obviously I wouldn't be where I am today. Well, and for folks that want to help you out as far as, uh, um, supporting you in, in apparel sales, do you guys got a current apparel run going right now? Or is there one in the works if there isn't? There might be one in the works. Um, honestly, the, I would love to get it going on. We just got so much we're thinking about and going on and whatnot. Um, I haven't even told you, my daughter plays travel softball that we go to damn near every weekend. So uh, we're nice and busy, but no, nothing in the works right now. Okay. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I would love to have something going. So I'm not ruling it out. Just got to find some time. Awesome. Well, it's been great to catch up with you and uh, great to uh, share some of these wonderful stories with you, Jake. And I wish you the best of luck for the rest of 2024 and, uh, and we'll be seeing each other soon. All righty. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Well, race fans, that does it for this interview. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope that you continue to enjoy these upcoming interviews. We appreciate it. If you would like and subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it's on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, wherever it's at, give us a like and give us a subscription so that we can deliver more of these great interviews to you for your listening pleasure. In the meantime, wherever we're at, wherever you're listening, we hope you have a great rest of your day and a pleasant evening. And we will see you soon here at High Side Racing Promotions. Before we let everybody go, here's the upcoming schedule on IMCA TV of live pay-per-view events. On Wednesday, June 12th, Buena Vista Raceway in Alta, Iowa and Stewart International Speedway in Iowa will be on hand for two races. Thursday, June 13th, Algona, Iowa's Kasuth County Speedway will be the only race on the card for IMCA TV. Friday, June 14th, will feature Iowa's Davenport Speedway. Dakota Speedway in Mandan, North Dakota, Beatrice Speedway in Nebraska, Slayton, Minnesota's Murray County Speedway, Black Hills Speedway in Rapid City, South Dakota, Dusa Club's Thunder Raceway in Sholo, Arizona, and California's Wairika Speedway. A full helping of racing action will be on tap for June 15th, Saturday night with Crystal Motor Speedway in Michigan, Iowa's tracks at Makokata Speedway and Boone Speedway, Eagle Raceway in Nebraska, Southern Oklahoma Speedway in Ardmore, Electric City Speedway in Great Falls, Montana, Cottage Grove Speedway in Oregon, couple of races in California, Bakersfield Speedway, Wairika Speedway, and Marysville Raceway. Also on Saturday, Deusa Club's Thunder Raceway in Sholo, Arizona. The lineup for Sunday, June 16th, Interstate Speedway in Jefferson, South Dakota, Dubuque Fairground Speedway in Iowa, Benton County Speedway in Vinton, Iowa, Buffalo River Speedway in Glendon, Minnesota, Minot, North Dakota's Nodak Speedway, and Southern Oregon Speedway in White City, Oregon. Monday, June 17th, they'll feature Coos Bay Speedway in Coos Bay, Oregon, and Tuesday night, the Douglas County Dirt Track in Roseburg, Oregon.